Thank you, everybody. I'm Jim O'Callaghan, the President and CEO of the South County EDC. For those of you I haven't met, and that's a lot. Um, I've met a lot of people via Zoom, Skype, whatever it may be over the past eight months, but it, it's still somewhat hard to put a face with a name sometimes. But um, really want to thank all of you for taking part in this. want to thank our representatives from the port and John with Pasha. Um, you know, over the past 30 years, the EDC has really focused on connecting business with our local representatives and those that help shape the, the cities that we all work and live in. Um, with that, you know, we obviously didn't want to miss a beat this year, even though we couldn't bring people physically together. We thought that putting together a virtual webinar series would be a great way to continue to get information out. Uh, last Tuesday, we had a great uh, session with two of our local mayors, and they uh, had about 68 attendees, I believe, so that was awesome. We have about 60-something registered for this. Some people come in drips and drabs as we go. We are recording the session just for those who do miss it that registered. We'd love to be able to share that information out with them. Um, just so you're aware, it is being recorded. Uh, but in, you know, in the end, our goal is really to make sure that businesses, uh, communities, everybody has an open dialogue back and forth and that we can continue even during times like this where it's difficult to do business the way we're traditionally used to. Uh, to be able to be that center point where we can bring people together and keep the conversation going. So, you know, the port of San Diego, obviously a huge economic driver here in our community and something of tremendous importance to all of us. And we really wanted to make sure that we were able to highlight all the great things that are coming, things that are going on. Uh, so with that, I am going to introduce uh, Steve Castaneda, who's with Sweetwater Authority. Uh, they have graciously sponsored our program today, and I'm going to turn it over to Steve to introduce our first speaker here. Well, thank you, Jim. I appreciate it, and I appreciate the uh, South County um, Economic Development Council's uh, work to continue to educate and help um, small businesses connect with their government uh, to ensure that, you know, all the investment and all the things we're working to make the South County even better um, are successful. So. Uh, I've, I've been involved uh, in the organization for a long time and, uh, you know, things are still moving forward, even in these trying times. But it gives me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to have been, uh, been serving as the chair of Sweetwater Authority for the last um, two years. And for those that aren't familiar with Sweetwater Authority, uh, we're a joint powers, uh, the South Bay Irrigation District and the uh, City of National City. Um, comprise the South or uh, the Sweetwater Authority. And so um, we have a seven member board, five are elected. Uh, those uh, members come from Chula Vista um, and uh, the Bonita area. And then we have two uh, members that represent National City that are appointed um, by the mayor and the city council of National City. Um, so we uh, provide uh, all of the potable water service to um, all of those communities. Um, but basically, uh, I just wanted to go into a real quick uh, sort of overview about our involvement in uh, this is this is a very, um, I think, uh, important subject because the Sweetwater Authority uh, will be providing water service to uh, the Chula Vista Bayfront project. And uh, we have, um, we are, you know, it's a big project for Sweetwater. It's, a, it's, it's, it's all new development, which is something we're not really used to. We're mainly infill type um, development service that we provide. So um, it has been uh, a little bit of a, of a, um, a learning curve for us, but we uh, have, uh, I think adapted quite well. And we meet with the Port District and the developers of the Bayfront uh, every two weeks, uh, we are uh, working out uh, all of the things. If you just think about how big the Bayfront is and think about all of the, the, the infrastructure, you know, obviously water is, a, is the main part of that. And we're happy to be, um, you know, an active partner on that. So I want to get into the program by introducing our first speaker. It's John Pesha. And uh, I think most of you know who he is and, and, and his uh, organization, but I just wanna tell you that since 2004, 
John has been in San Diego where he manages the Pesha Automotive Services Operation headquartered in National City at the Marine Terminal. The location uh, began handling automobiles in 1990 and all of us that drive up and down the I-5 have seen his trucks and uh, all those vehicles. Um, the first year the company processed 30,000 cars and, and employed uh, 30 team members. Since then, the company has processed over 6 million vehicles. Uh, Mr. Pesha has been active in various boards in our community, including the YMCA, the South County Economic Development Council, the Working Waterfront, and the National City Chamber of Commerce. Uh, he has uh, worked and lived in South America and Europe in various capacities, uh, based in Switzerland as a managing director in 1999 and assumed responsibility for European operations to expand the company's integrated global logistics, logistics offerings throughout Europe. He holds a master's uh, in science and supply chain management from the University of San Diego and a BA from Santa Clara University with a major in English and minors in business and Spanish. Uh, please welcome John. Uh, John, please, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for that warm welcome, and thanks for uh, thanks to the the South County EDC to ha uh, for having me this morning. It's an honor and a privilege, um, and I will I will dive right into it. Um, you know, we were asked, I think, to kind of give a little perspective on where Pesha is locally in San Diego, but also comment on some of the industry trends um, that we've been seeing during this this COVID pandemic and. Um, I think I would just start by saying, you know, we were fortunate in um, being able to continue operations from the get-go. Um, we were deemed, you know, essential service and took that very seriously. And so I think that was the first, first point was making sure that we did not have a hiccup there. Um, we embraced the PPE and social distancing and, and keeping all the uh, equipment and everything in uh, working order with all labor unions uh, supporting that so that we would continue our mission. And, and we were very successful um, with that. So I think just fundamentally that's been uh, a, a success story for the company. Um, we had an ISO audit in uh, April. We passed, they used drones uh, to actually look in at our operations and um, it, the world is certainly evolving as we know it, isn't it? Um, so anyway, um, I think, you know, once uh, once we were able to just stabilize how to operate in this environment, um, we began kind of embracing the impacts. And, and I'll just kind of go through a little bit, uh, starting with the Hawaii service. For, for those who, who don't know the Hawaii uh, program that we oper operate, um, we essentially um, handle both roll-on, roll-off and uh, container service to and from uh, the West Coast and the Hawaiian Islands. Um, on the West Coast, that's coming out of San Diego with uh, two of our vessels, the Jean Anne and the Marjorie C. They're named after our grandmothers, my grandmothers. Um, and one of those is a, a pure roll-on, roll-off car carrier and the other a uh, container roll-on, roll-off um, uh, ship. And the other vessels are coming out of either Long Beach or Oakland <clears throat> and uh, uh, bringing you know, anything and everything you can imagine to the islands. Um, so we were able to uh, maintain continuity of those vessel operations throughout this pandemic, um, replenishing consumer goods and groceries kind of remain steady. Construction jobs um, were also steady. I think we've seen that here in San Diego as well. Uh, and even military uh, projects remain steady. Uh, hospitality, of course, was the big gap. And so the tourist industry continues to be really the, the hardest hit in the islands, um, rent cars coming back um, in in high numbers early on, and you know very slowly trickling to the islands for the last many months. Um, in uh, October, we saw the kind of pre-arrival testing program um, with I think it was ten thousand initial arrivals in one day. That was up from I think two thousand a day uh, going into Hawaii. So the tourism industry kind of bounced back and, and honestly I'm not sure if that's kind of reversing right now as we know in San Diego we're kind of sliding backwards a little bit and throughout the nation we're, we're experiencing that as well but uh, at least they, they did uh, 
kind of <clears throat> surpassed quite a hurdle in terms of getting everything organized to be able to accommodate the, the tourist industry again after kind of a long time of quarantining and, and doing some other pretty radical stuff to um, to make sure it was safe for, for folks to be back in the islands. Um, and honestly, the forecast, I really don't know that anyone knows right now until that vaccine comes through, which hopefully is soon, uh, you know, where where those numbers are headed. So we're, we're kind of just focused on keeping everything right now um, moving along as we can. We are looking uh, with a lot of the other industries at Mitsera, the Maritime Transportation System Emer Emergency Relief Act uh, legislation, opportunities to help out uh, transportation and, and industries in the Hawaiian Islands um, to try and mitigate some of the, the impacts, as you can imagine, just a lot of people suffering over there, <clears throat> the small businesses especially. Um, on the automotive side of our business, um, which National City Marine Terminal is, is really kind of the, the largest operation that we have in that, that group, um, we were hit hard early on. Um, the, <clears throat> you know, initially as we see kind of um, any downturn cycle, the first thing that happens is cars stack up in all the different ports. Uh, that was not uh, unique in San Diego. Um, we hold about 25,000 cars at the, the high end here. Um, and then we've got to go off site and we've got some facilities in Otai and, and elsewhere that we, that we manage that. Um, <clears throat> and after about a month uh, of that, we, we saw the, the, the arrivals really start dropping. And so Europe actually um, ceased entirely for about a month. Um, and, and predominantly our imports are Asian and uh, European. So we kind of got through all that. Um, we are seeing the numbers pick up now, uh, which is encouraging. Uh, we think that the forecast for car sales in general will be, maybe be only down about 14% for the year. Um, but uh, the brakes did hit really hard <laughs> really early on. So we're down to about 8,000 cars on the ground, uh, which is lowest we've ever seen. Um, so just really kind of crazy times in terms of uh, the automobile industry here. Um, we have been able to diversify um, a lot of our offerings in, in San Diego, which has been helpful. Um, I think Joel Valenzuela talked about this a little bit in some of his recent presentations, um, looking at doing more, more, excuse me, more modes out of San Diego has been helpful. Uh, mixing more rail service onto the facility, both uh, in terms of being able to get the exports uh, or excuse me, imports in and, and out by rail has increased, as well as um, taking on some of the Toyota traffic um, that's built down in Mexico and handling it through here and out by rail has really helped kind of balance our overall por portfolio here. Um, the overall sales, I think, are projected to be somewhere around 17 million cars in uh, in uh, 2020, um, excuse me, down from 17 to 14.8, which is that 13% drop. Um, let's see, in terms of other industry trends, our container business that we're seeing um, in LA Long Beach, if you followed some of their news lately, is absolutely just going gangbusters. I think you're seeing a lot of the Christmas rush hit um, and, uh, everybody's ordering online. So they are a bit overwhelmed up there right now, um, which is encouraging, I think, overall in terms of trade being back up and, and the economy picking back up. In our steel side of the house, uh, we're the largest steel importer on the West Coast in Los Angeles. Um, that is starting uh, to, to come back, but it has been down about 40%. So um, We'll see what Joe Biden and his tariff policies are going to do for that market, but um, steel has been been down considerably. Um, those are really the main businesses that we carry um, cargo through the West Coast um, that we wanted to report on. <clears throat> I think the other thing that we want to talk just a little bit about is some of the investments that we've made. And you see um, a lot of improvements coming in in the National City Marine Terminal in the last uh, couple of years. We just finished a, a multi-million dollar facility for Porsche, one of our big customers. 
They're uh, a part of the Volkswagen family. They've got a lot of different brands there, Volkswagen, Audi, and Porsche, Lamborghini, and Bentley all come in under <clears throat> the same um, vessels. So we put a absolute beautiful showcase facility for Porsche with um, epoxy floors and state-of-the-art equipment in there, which we're proud of. And that released just earlier this year. Um, we also are building a couple of new container ships that are um, the first of their kind. They're pure liquid natural gas LNG. Um, they are going to be operating on LNG in the first day of service. Uh, the, the first going to Hawaii of that nature um, that'll be operating in LNG day one. Um, most technologically advanced environmentally friend, friendly vessels uh, to serve that trade, trade lanes that will actually meet the IMO 2030 standards. And so you can imagine incorporating clean fuels and in, in, uh, in the vessel and terminal operations has been pretty difficult. LNG does not exist currently in uh, LA or Long Beach over the dock. We're actually having to bring uh, trucks in to fuel those, those new ships. And so we're working with uh, the local authorities and agencies to get all that up and running uh, until LNG is really a stable um, <clears throat> offered you know, fuel um, in, in that market. So kind of interesting stuff there. We've done a whole lot of, uh, of work with the Port of San Diego and different agencies in terms of uh, leveraging and working grant opportunities that has electrified a lot of our port equipment. Um, we've got some BYD all electric trucks at the Port of San Diego and um, we're using a lot of that stuff up in uh, Oakland and Long Beach as well through our Logix operations. And uh, I think you're gonna see a lot more of that coming in as we um, <clears throat> kind of see, especially California focusing on electrification as just being not, not only nice to have, but a must have uh, and under Newsom's administration and, and some of the other legislative efforts we just see that growing and growing. So try to keep it crisp for you guys. That, that's kind of the nutshell, uh, what's going on in our world. And um, I'm happy to take any questions if you have any. And uh, again, appreciate the opportunity to give you guys a little bit of an update on what we're doing here in San Diego and throughout, um, throughout our operations. Really appreciate, appreciate that, John. Thank you so much. Um, we can open it up for questions either through chat or if you want to raise your hand. I don't know what the easiest way is here for anybody that has a question. But while we're getting ready to field some questions, I did have a question that kind of came up as part of your presentation there. Was when you were mentioning that auto sales are only predicted to be down 14%, but you have the lowest on hand inventory you've had. How are you with 8,000, I guess, sitting on lot? How are you planning or... Are you prepared to meet the need with bringing in cars at a quicker rate later in the beginning of next year, I guess? Um, good question. We are. We've got um, a very, very good workforce here um, that have all been well-trained and cross-trained and um, are, are, I would say, pretty unique in that we kind of multi-use the, the skilled labor in different accounts that we have um, that just allows us to be able to swallow elephants, we say all the time here. Um, so, you know, we've got a, a very well-trained workforce. Um, frankly, you know, with having fewer cars on the ground, we're more efficient than ever right now. Um, we, um, yeah, we don't anticipate a lot of headaches things operate really well when we don't have a lot of volume on the ground, to be honest. <laughs> it's when things get congested, when it gets really tricky to handle it. And right now you are seeing, even though um, there's 8,000 cars on the ground, uh, the volume's turning pretty quickly. Um, and so, yeah, it's really just a matter of keeping up with pace here. All right. Well, thank you. We had a question come in here with your expertise in supply chain management. How has COVID changed the industry or what learnings have you observed? Oh, wow. Um, you know, I think first and foremost is just being able to figure out what those regulations are that allow you to continue to operate. And again, we've been somewhat fortunate that we're deemed essential. Um, 
And so I, I do feel for the industries that have had to shut down startup, shut down startup, while we've been able to basically focus on what do we need to do to to carry on, um, you know, operations. I think what what has changed has been, um, you know, largely trying to get just um, some of the some of the regular regulatory issues kind of keeping up with that. I think um, the game is changing kind of daily, and so you've got to adapt. And, and we're seeing the companies that do that well um, thrive. The ones that don't do so well, uh, um, it can be really kind of damaging because you can imagine it one day, oh, I don't have the right stuff to operate. Um, the ripples in the supply chain happen very, very fast. And so, uh, again, we've been fortunate to keep up with that. We've been supportive of other operations that um, have not been at the ready. Um, so I think think that's the main, the main thing is just to foresee kind of where where the issues are going to hit you be prepared. And, and fortunately we've been, we've been in front of those. That's great. Um, we had a question kind of going in a different direction, talking about some of the, the new equipment that you're building, um, asking something about how are the, what are the design parameters for the new ships and where are they being built? Sure. Um, so Brownsville, Texas is where these ships are actually being built. Um, and you can see the in my background picture um, one of the new ones. So these are actually named after my parents, George III and Janet Marie. The George III actually should be in service um, third week of January is is our anticipated um, first sailing. And uh, you can't see, but on the back end of that uh, ship is a very large um, LNG tank, and that's what powers you know these um, these newer ships. Um, I don't know all the specs, but it's a big container ship. Um, it, it's a little bit larger than the ones that we've been employing, uh, which will give us a little bit of an advantage in terms of what we can carry. Um, you know, the, um, the, the fueling is a little bit particular. It's kind of, kind of been interesting in terms of um, just getting that whole um, setup to work in, in LA Long Beach has been a challenge. Even though you want to do the right thing, um, you know, <laughs> we've got LNG that we're trying to employ, you know, in uh, the trucks that are carrying that fuel from, you know, origin to the docks. Uh, that was kind of a hurdle that we had to cross to get all that permitted and approved. Um, so I, <laughs> anyway, I could go on for a long time about regulatory stuff, but, um, you know, the, the ships are, are coming soon and, you um, and they are really the newest technology out there. Matson actually built similar ships here at uh, NASCO. Um, they built two of them. However, they're they're not uh, currently using the LNG 100% uh, uh, as we are. So um, anyway, I, did I answer that question? <laughs> so, to actually dig a little bit further, how long <laughs> do you think it'll uh, LNG availability will lag behind at some of these ports? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I think they're working hard on a lot of different clean clean um, fuels, you know, hydrogen and LNG. And it, it, there's a lot of effort being uh, done on that. I think, you know, we will probably not see something on dock there for a couple of years is my guess. Um, but, you know, the solutions that we've got are clean and, and are going to be uh, functioning day one. So... That's great. There, a question also came in. Now, obviously, we're going to see a change in administration. What type of tax um, raises or concerns are you seeing with uh, potential different administration and proposals that have been made already to date? Um, honestly, I really don't have a comment there. I, your guess is as good as mine. Uh... <laughs> Paraphrase a question for you. So. Um, so I guess another question came in about LNG. Is there any possibility that you could load LNG at the Sempra facility in Ensenada? Oh, another good question. Um, you know, possible. The problem is with our vessel service, um, because we're liner to Hawaii, we really don't have a lot of time um, to go out of route. And so you know, we've had, we've tried working other ports in rotation, even, even with the roll on roll off side, which is maybe a little bit more flexible. The container side is an absolute, you know, Swiss watch. It, 
we're we're working minutes, not hours, but minutes in in the schedule to to make sure that we keep everything in play. Probably the hardest thing, if you can imagine, you know, there's not a lot of capacity in Hawaii to um, to take on ships, and so there's a rotation that everybody has to slot into. And if you miss the rotation and you miss your window, bad bad things can happen to your service. Um, so we're you know we're we're very very high in terms of our percentage of arrivals and on time, um, and I think that's one of the reasons that we've we've managed to be successful there. Uh, it's really easy to be um, behind. <laughs> you, you just don't want to do that. So, you know, we we will be looking for solution that fits into that that sailing schedule locally there in, in Long Beach. John, I really want to thank you for your time this morning and appreciate you sharing all this insight. And I know as we have other questions come up, we'll be able to share them with you and probably get answers back. Um, so if there's anything I can do to help you in this time, please let me know. But uh, we look forward to continuing to work together. So. Thanks so much, Jim. Appreciate the time. Thanks, John. And I'm going to hand it back to Steve to introduce our next speaker. Uh, thanks, Jim. And uh, thanks, John. Appreciate that. And, um, you know, we're looking forward to a very robust recovery. That's for sure. Um, Robert Duque Valderrama, who we all know, uh, was sworn in to represent the city of National City in January of 2005. He's retired from the construction industry and uh, he was the owner of AD&D Drywall Inc. and West Coast Sta Scaffolding Inc. Commissioner Valderrama served on no, no, uh, numerous public and private boards, including the San Diego Water County Water Authority, uh, San Diego uh, Bowl Game Association, the Southwestern College Foundation Board, South County Economic um, Development Council, Artisans uh, Insurance Limited, and the Chairman of the Risk Control Committee, uh, California Professional Association of Specialty Contractors. Uh, he was also the Chairman of the California Construction Council, the ABC San Diego Drywall Residence Insurance Board, and uh, the National City Chamber of Commerce. He has uh, been very busy over his public uh, career. Uh, he's also received a number of honors and awards uh, through his tenure. 2017 Inaugural Ocean Connectors Leadership Award, 2017 May Maytime Band Review Grand Marshal, 2017 Barrio Logan uh, Barrio Station Lifetime Achievement Award, 2018 San Diego County uh, Economic uh, Council uh, Lifetime Achievement Award, um, National City Chamber of Com Commerce Lifetime Achievement Award, and the 2019 Southwestern College Foundation Jaguar Award. Um, please um, uh, open up for uh, Dookie. Kind of, it's, it's kind of interesting when you're virtual, you can't really, you know, <laughs> please welcome. It's a little strange. So I have to think about a different way to enter into that. But Dookie, please. Thank you, Steve. First of all, I want to thank your organization for uh, for sponsoring this event today. Without organizations like your, we, uh, we would not be able to have these kind of uh, venues. So first, thank you very much. Uh, it's kind of strange that, you know, we always have the elected official receptions and we were able to gather a bunch of uh, individuals together. And uh, because of COVID, we've had to uh, change. And uh, I really want to thank South County Economic Development Council uh, for uh, going this venue and, and uh, doing it all virtual. So the, the port's ex I'm really excited to be able to talk about uh, great things that are happening in, in, in the South Bay. Um, and we will also have our chairman, uh, Ann Moore, come up and talk about uh, projects in the Chula Vista. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with the Port of San Diego, this kind of gives you a, a brief overview of what the port is all about. We've obviously got 34 miles of waterfront, um, 2,400 acres of Port Thailand, uh, 11,800 acres of Thailand's water, and 8,300 acres of transferred water to us. So it kind of gives you an idea. Anything that's revolving the water in the San Diego Bay, the port has their hand in it. The only part that we don't is uh, the section of the, the bay that the, the Navy controls, but uh, we have a strong collaboration with them. 
I also wanted to uh, mention before we go on to the next slide, I really want to thank, thank John Patient and Patia Automotive Group. Uh, thank you for the presentation, number one. Number two, uh, they are one of our most viable in, uh, tenants that we have. They are the biggest revenue producers that bring in revenue for the Port of San Diego through the city of National City. Uh, they've been a, a great asset to us and uh, they've, again, as, as John indicated, they got new ships coming online. And I think it's really beautiful that they've named the ships after the first two ships after their his grandmother, and and the next ship is going to be after his his uh, his dad who just passed away recently. So thank you, John. I uh, excellent presentation, and thank you for everything that you do. Uh, next slide. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the work and waterfront mural that we have in in National City. Uh, it, to the left of it, you can see cars that are parked uh, that belong under the auspices of, uh, of Pesha, and but right next to it, we have what is known as the distribution center. If you're driving by Interstate 5 uh, and 54, and if you look to, uh, to, to the west, you'll see this big mural that we just had uh, in, uh, uh, an artist come in and, uh, and, and painted this. And what this picture depicts is uh, uh, the working waterfront. Uh, th th these are, uh, uh, we're trying to reflect what, what the working waterfront is all, all about. And so we, we, we retained uh, an artist uh, called uh, Das, D-A-A-S. He was a Texan-based uh, contemporary artist. He was commissioned by the, for this mural by the port in the spring of 2019 following a uh, national call uh, for artists, um, and, and and it's really a beautiful job because it really does depict what the working waterfront is all about. I mean, the working waterfront, you know, the port, we do have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, hotels, but the the, uh, the working waterfront is really the backbone of what the port is all about, and uh, without, the, without, without them, we would not be the port that we are today. Uh, so, uh, uh, let's go on to the next slide, but if you get an opportunity, you'll be able to see that. Uh, other projects in National City, um, we have the Bayshore Bike. Uh, this has been under the uh, leadership of Supervisor Cox, who is uh, uh, finishing up his last, uh, last part of this term. But one of the big things that he wanted to do was be able to build a first class bike, uh, bike center throughout the whole San Diego County Bay. And a lot of it has come to fruition. And one of the things is, one of the big projects is in National City. The port put $900,000 to the Bayshore Bikeway uh, National City segment, uh, which is, uh, and so we're hoping to, uh, that that, well, we know that that'll be forthcoming um, uh, in, the, in the very near future. It's, it's uh, one of the things as a cyclist, I. I've ridden through uh, there many a times and, and to be able to have a first class uh, type one bike path is, is one of the safest things you can do for any kind of bicyclist. One of the other things that we're doing is we're, uh, we're spending $250,000 of Wayfair signage going throughout National City so you'll have better indications of what is going on uh, in, in the, while you're going through, uh, throughout National City. Another thing that we just recently did, we are partnering, 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 partnering with SDG&E on an electrical vehicle charging station for Pe Pepper Park. Uh, we hope to have that uh, installed uh, the first part of, uh, uh, of next year. Uh, part of our uh, being able to be environmentally uh, uh, friendly and so we will have charging stations at Pepper Park. So uh, we're really uh, pleased with that. Uh, and so that'll be forthcoming. Uh, and for those of you who have not had an opportunity to go out to Pepper Park, it's one of the smallest parks in National City, but it's, it's, a, it's a little gem. So if you haven't been, had an opportunity to get out there, we strongly encourage you. Uh, can you go to the next slide here? One of the things that we've been working on for a long time is, is that I grew up on the west side of National City and where patient presently operates, that was basically the my playground where all of my friends used to go with our bikes and uh, and and, uh, and play. And uh, and when patient came in, they they brought in good paying jobs and brought in essential services that were needed in the South Bay. 
but in the process of doing that, uh, uh, we're one of the few community, we're the, we're the only port city that really doesn't have access to the bayfront. We do have access to it through the, through the Sweetwater Channel right there. And so as a result of that, well, what I've been working on along with my other fellow commissioners is what is known as a balanced plan. Uh, trying to be able to open up more of the, our waterfront to our community, but at the same time, not impede the, the tremendous uh, businesses that are operating at our, uh, at our terminal operation. So as a result of that, we uh, have agreed tentatively to increase the park space. Uh, we're gonna close down some, uh, some uh, roads on Thailand's Avenue to be able to give more land space to, to patients, even though right now they're, they're down right now. When they're back to uh, at full strength, they're, they're, they have to ship out many of their vehicles to uh, other areas in the South Bay. So we're trying to improve the efficiency of the uh, throughput at National City. So we will close down some roads uh, to be able to give them more capacity. But in the meantime, we, uh, we're going to be able to uh, uh, utilize some of the land that they're utilizing right now. We'll be putting in uh, uh, an RV. Uh, we're looking at putting in an RV park, some hotels down there. So there's some big developments that we're looking to do in National City. But we couldn't do this without working in collaboration with our partners, which is the, the working waterfront. Uh, nobody likes to give up land, but at the same time, they also realize that you, it's, it, business is important, but you also have to provide benefits to the community. And that's what the balance plan is all about, is be able to uh, maximize the, the efficiency of the working waterfront, but at the same time, provide more amenities to the community to be able to have access to the waterfront. So we're, we're making great uh, uh, progress on that. So the next project we're gonna be talking about is uh, Pond 20. Uh, Pond 20 is, is where the salt flats are at. And most of you have seen that. And what we're trying to do is we've got uh, about 95 acres of undeveloped parcels of land, which is uh, between Palm Avenue and the San Diego National Marine Wildlife in South San, San Diego Bay. The port has presently analyzed the potential development of 83.5 acres of its wetland mitigation bank. Uh, the proposed Pod 20 mitigations have development projects in a collaborative, and so we're having to work with a lot of agencies, uh, but if we can get a mitigation bank out of it, uh, we're looking at it. We've, we're going through a bunch of uh, processes right now. We hope to come back to the board later, uh, if, uh, first part of next year, and be able to uh, see more uh, development of this uh, undeveloped land. Uh, next, project, next slide. Imperial Beach. Um, for, for those of you who haven't been on the on the pier recently, you'll notice that we did some uh, upgrades up there. We've uh, repainted the restaurant, we repainted the restrooms, we repainted the lifeguard towers, and coming soon we hope to have some murals and uh, and and do some more stuff there. Uh, we propose to have a new fishing rod station and replacement of the benches and fishing cleaning station. Uh, for the, I go to Imperial Beach a lot uh, because that's the where I be able to, where me and my wife and our grandkids are able to go to really enjoy the, the the oceanfront and to be able to see the pride that Imperial Beach is putting in on their waterfront and in conjunction working with the port. I'm really pleased to be able to see the uh, improvements that we've made. And I really want to thank uh, my fellow commissioner, uh, Commissioner Malcolm, uh, for working very closely with the port staff to be able to see the upgrades in Imperial Beach. Next slide. Oh, well, that pretty much concludes uh, everything that I wanted to talk about. Uh, we're going to have our chairman and more come up and speak in a couple of seconds, talking about the wonderful things that we're going to be doing in Chula Vista. Steve, I, I don't know if I'm deferring it back to you for the introduction. Yes, I think that I think that's uh, well, Jim, and we're, we're hopscotching around here a little bit. But Dookie, thank you very much. That was uh, that was wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Jim, should I go ahead and introduce Ann? Yeah, unless or we're, we're going to take questions. Yeah, I mean, we're going to take two questions with Dookie. Yeah. Why don't we do this, Steve? Because we're uh, we're 15 on. We got 15 minutes left. Let's get the next presentation in, and between the two of us, we can answer any questions that come up on the 
on port, but we can make sure we get Ann's uh, presentation in there. Perfect. That's, that, that's a great decision. Thank you. Um, and uh, Ann Moore was sworn into the Board of Port Commissioners uh, in uh, January of 2011 to represent the city of Chula Vista. Uh, she served as uh, Chula Vista's city attorney and practiced law uh, for more than 20 years with extensive experience in land use, real estate, redevelopment, environmental, and municipal law. Uh, Anne represents both developers and governmental agencies in processing land use entitlement entitlements for la uh, large scale residential, commercial, and industrial projects. Her areas of expertise include the California Environmental Quality Act, the Subdivision Map, Map Act, uh, Eminent Domain, Inver Inverse Condemnation, Endangered Species Act, Public inf and Public inf uh, Information public infrastructure financing. She also is an expert in the, in the Brown Act and conflict of interest laws. Moore graduated from the San Diego State University with a public administration degree and she earned her law degree at the University of San Diego Law School. And uh, she has been a tremendous uh, representative for the city of Chula Vista. And uh, I am very proud of the fact that uh, when I was on the city council there, I supported her appointment. So uh, Anne, if you join us. Oh, great, thank you. Thank you, Steve, for that introduction. And uh, yes, you, you're very instrumental um, and I appreciate that. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me here to talk about really my favorite project. Uh, I will be focusing on the dramatic and historic progress being made on the Chula Vista Bayfront. While many of you have been involved in this project, like Steve Casaneda when he was on the city council, others may not be as familiar with it, so I will provide some of uh, background on it. As a Chula Vista native, uh, this project is really close to my heart. I've been involved for more than 20 years, both while I was the Chula Vista city attorney and as a port commissioner. So I will very briefly touch on the history of this project for those watching who are new to our area. The Chula Vista Master Bayfront Plan is the largest waterfront development opportunity on the West Coast at approximately 535 acres. This area is being transformed right before our eyes, bringing to fruition more than a decade of planning and investment. More than a decade of community input and hundreds of public meetings resulted in the plan that you see here. It was a joint effort by the Port of San Diego and the city of Chula Vista. In fact, South County EDC was among the original stakeholders who participated in the development of this plan. And many of you have been among our most vocal supporters and we do appreciate you. In 2012, this visionary master plan was approved by the Coastal Commission. It includes a resort, hotel, and convention center, plus additional hotels, condos, retail, and supporting infrastructure. There is a substantial amount of public access and infrastructure, including parks, open space, habitat preservation, roads, and waterways. We have made, next slide please, Brian. Thank you. Uh, we have made incredible progress since our plan was approved back in 2012. The implosion and demolition of an old power plant and the extension of H Street are among the milestones that we have celebrated in recent years. The highlighted areas on this map show some of the current projects. Together, we are fulfilling the community's vision for a thriving recreational, residential, and resort destination on the Chula Vista waterfront. And behind the scenes, a lot of work is happening to ensure that this project is done right and that it is fiscally sustainable for our future. First, I'll give you an update on the shovels in the groundwork already happening on the site. Then I'll update you on the administrative and financial aspects that are equally important to our overall schedule, which are moving forward at the same time. Within the port's jurisdiction, several projects are taking shape. The centerpiece is the Gaylord Pacific Resort and Convention Center. We remain confident that we can get this project done and that it will be a catalyst for development for more hotels, retail, and other development on the project as Gaylord hotels have done throughout the country. 
We are closer now than we have ever been to having a world-class hotel and convention center in the South Bay. We believe it will be a job creator and economic catalyst. As we work with the city of Chula Vista and Rita to secure financing for the project, Rita is preparing for some early construction to prepare the site even before the close of escrow. We have a number of very important agreements related to the financing that will be coming before the Ports Board soon and before the City Council. We are proud, of the Chula, that, we are proud that Chula Vista will be Gaylord's first West Coast location. It will have approximately 1,600 hotel rooms, a convention center with four ballrooms, three levels of meeting space, and two outdoor meeting and event lawns, public promenades and public amenities, and associated retail and resort level amenities, such as a pool with a lazy river, a spa, and much more. We are working closely with the city of Chula Vista and with Rita to close escrow in mid-2021 and complete construction approximately three years later with an opening in 2024. Though we haven't broken ground on the Gaylord project, our efforts to transform the Chula Vista Bayfront have already achieved success. We held the groundbreaking for the Costa Vista RV Resort project about a year ago. Since then, the $50 million, 246 stall RV resort has been under construction at East Street and Bay Boulevard near the Living Coast Discovery Center. This project will not only be a premier West Coast RV park in a prime waterfront location, but it will also deliver significant public amenities, including the enhancement of public access to and public recreation on the Chula Vista waterfront. Costa Vista will feature a mix of both traditional RV stalls and vacation rentals. Amenities will be open to the public and will include pools, a day spa, a restaurant, an arcade and game room, outdoor grills, children's rock planning and playground, and much more. The opening is scheduled for early next year. The Costa Vista RV Resort is now even accepting reservations for 2021 if anybody's interested. So here are some progress photos of the work that's being done. Near the RV resort, similar to H Street, that was successfully completed in 2014, we are extending E Street toward the bay, further improving public access to the waterfront. We will be realigning Gunpowder Point Drive to allow continued access to the Living Coast Discovery Center. And for a sneak peek of the vacation rentals, open house viewing of the two models is currently being offered at the Chula Vista RV Park on Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays at uh, 6 p.m. So next we're gonna show you a video of the Chula Vista Bayfront Sweetwater Bicycle Path. Great, thank you, Brian. Our groundbreaking last year also marked the start of another project currently under construction, the Sweetwater Bicycle Path and Promenade Project, which will form part of the regional Bayshore Bikeway. This project is just one of the no cost amenities available to the public to explore and enjoy the Chula Vista Bayfront. This video shows a completed portion of the path. It stretches from Marine Group Boatworks at the southern end up to Costa Vista RV Resort. When this project is complete, it will be a three quarter mile class one bike path and pedestrian promenade. You can see the views from the path are quite spectacular. The cost of this project is $5.6 million, 4.8 million of which is being funded through an urban greening grant awarded to the port by the California Natural Resource Agency. An additional $15 million in public improvements will be constructed as part of the Costa Vista RV Resort project. The two projects combined reflect, reflect nearly $20 million in public improvements so far for the Chula Vista Bayfront. These results are the product of good planning for our community, which guarantees the public realm enhances the public enjoyment and facilitates private investment. So great, uh, next shot is our Sweetwater uh, Park and you see it here in concept. 
The Sweetwater Park will connect visitors with the Bayfront's ecology and provide environmental educational opportunities and family child oriented recreational exploration. We were pleased to approve a coastal development permit for the Sweetwater Park in April, which was a result of our extensive community outreach together with the city. We held four community design workshops in 2018 and 2019 and presentations to the Bayfront Cultural Design Committee and the Wildlife Advisory Group. Our next spectacular project is the Harbor Park and here you see it in concept and it will provide signature amenities, recreational opportunities and programming. We anticipate taking this item to the Ports Board for approval as soon as December. Combined, the Harbor and Sweetwater Park will account for more than half of the new park space planned for the Chula Vista Bayfront. We anticipate construction on these parks to begin after Rita breaks ground on the Resort Hotel and Convention Center. Also, this summer, the port opened two public art opportunities and received qualifications from over 250 artists interested in being selected. To ensure broad input and an inclusive process, review panels made up of a diverse stakeholder, uh, stakeholders will screen the applications and artist qualifications. Those groups include the Ports Arts, Cultural and Design Committee, the Chula Vista Cultural Arts Commission, and the Bayfront Cultural Design Committee, as well as the Park Design Consultants and community members. There will be more public outreach coming soon. Next. Um, as mentioned, this project is very carefully designed to include a balance of uses, the private investments that will help us pay for the public improvements. This kind of deal is called a public-private partnership, and it would not be possible without a strong partnership between the city and the port, along with the private developer. We are currently preparing this project for the financing stage in which we will enter the public market to secure bond financing. From the beginning, we have said that the Bayfront will pay for itself, and it will. Simply put, we will be using various public revenues generated by the Bayfront to pay the bonds for building the roads, parks, utilities, and other infrastructure. The idea is simple, but the execution can be complex. Over a period of several months, staff are drafting numerous documents to support the transaction. These documents are part of this massive project and they all need to be aligned with each other. The documents include a ground lease, site lease, facility lease, and a plan of finance, bond indenture, bond purchase agreement, and special tax district loan agreement, support agreement, and a municipal services agreement. Before we go to the bond market, we will also pursue what's called the validation action in which a judge will, will review all of the documents to ensure that everything is done properly. The financial stage is critical to get right before we can close escrow. Our team's careful execution of this process is, keep, is on track even amid the national economic downturn due to COVID-19. We are continually monitoring the market conditions so that we can be proactive and prepared when we enter the bond market. Chula Vista Bayfront will be a unique place for people to live, work, and play. We are realizing the potential of our Bayfront as a tourist destination and as a recreational place for our residents and neighbors. The Bayfront will contribute to our economic development and job creation strategy, and it will add to the quality of life for the San Diego region, the South Bay, Chula Vista residents, and coastal visitors while protecting our natural resources. Overall, our economic analysis shows that the Chula Vista Bayfront project will be a tremendous job creator for the region with 10,000 construction jobs and 20,000 permanent jobs, most of those in the hospitality and tourism sector. We are mindful that this Bayfront is an integral part of the Chula Vista community and that it must be inviting and accessible to the people of California and the community, and we are focused on making it the best it can be. With that, I want to thank the South County EDC for your continued um, partnership, advocacy, and support of this project. Thank you so much. And I want to thank Chair Moore and Commissioner Valderrama for joining us and being able to share all this great insight. 
Um, I have had a couple of questions come in and look, I know we're gonna run up against time. So if there are those that need to leave, I completely appreciate that. But I do wanna have some questions answered that have come in if time permits. So one of the questions that has come in and I'll open it up to both of you and maybe you could share a little bit is with all this great development and reuse of some of the space around the port, what's being done to mitigate impacts on the environment and um, some species that are there in that area? Well, you know, the, you know, we do have, you know, we, the port is involved with the city of Chula Vista, the city of uh, IB, and we've sued the government because of the uh, pollution coming into the Tijuana River, into our bay. So we are a strong advocate of protecting the the waterfront and, and doing anything we can to protect our environment. So we, that's why we elected to be a, a main participant in that lawsuit because uh, we believe that it's our duty and our responsibility to protect the the, the, the coastline and all of our environment. So, Anne, I'll defer to you if you have any other that you wanted to add to that. Uh, not much to add, um, Dukey, as the Dean of the Commission. I, I think you filled it in pretty well. Um, with respect to the Chula Vista project, I can say that uh, the project has gone through extensive CEQA review and that there is a mitigation and monitoring program for the project. And so we know that all the impacts that are the result of this project will in fact be mitigated and habitat and natural resources will be preserved as part of the project. And I think this project speaks a lot to it, but I also wanted to get this question answered for some. How have you seen, and both of you have been involved, Duke, probably a little bit longer, um, with the evolution of the port's relationship with the communities it, it resides within and serves for that matter. Dookie, did you want to start with that? I did, I, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question, Jim. Um, how have you seen, and I think these projects are probably a really good example of that, but the relationship between the community and the port, how have you seen that evolve over the years? Oh, yeah, I think, it, you know, one of the things I'll use the Chula Vista Bayfront as a perfect example. I mean, we've, we were recognized and received an award for our, the way we uh, obtain community participation work. We brought together environmentalists, developers, and the community to be able to move forward on this plan. And so we, we're proud that we always want to reach out uh, and, and make sure that we're taking in concern all parties' interests to be able to uh, put put together the, the most efficient, most effective product that we can. Uh, so yeah, there's a perfect example example of how we reach out, and I think the the process has worked beautifully. And yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, and Chula Vista is sort of the template that we're actually using for other projects um, in the Bay. Uh, for Chula Vista, as Dukey said, there was probably over a hundred uh, public meetings with the various different stakeholders. And I'm sure Steve Castaneda was probably at, uh, at at least a few of them. <laughs> so um, that is definitely sort of the model that we actually follow now. And I know Dukey has been really involved uh, with his community and putting together the, the balance plan that if it you know wasn't for, for that you know sort of outreach to the community with uh, Dukey there spearheading it, I mean, that had been sort of stalled for quite some time now. And I think it was really reaching out to the public and getting that community sort of input, I think that really was, you know, the catalyst for moving that project forward. And uh, again, these are the examples uh, that we follow when we look at our projects. I think we may have a question by our chair, uh, John Moot here. Okay, uh, am I off the mute? Yes, you are. Okay. Um, Dukey, you went into a little bit at the last um, uh, elected officials meeting about the status of the garage, uh, but I must, I must say I didn't follow it completely. Could maybe you and Ann give a sort of update on where that is? I know there was a lawsuit. I can't tell whether that was dismissed and there's ongoing negotiations, but obviously a garage is going to be necessary um, you know, at this site. Could you tell us a little bit more about where that's at? I'm going to defer to, to the chair on that one. 
Okay. All right. Thank you, Duki. Uh, there was a lawsuit uh, regarding we were collecting a fee uh, from car rental um, um, businesses uh, to pay for the parking garage. And there was a lawsuit. Uh, we, the port, had settled that with the um, car uh, rental companies. And uh, we will not be using the fee as a way to actually build the parking garage. But we are looking at various different alternatives uh, right now to, to pay for the parking garage. And we are talking with Rita and uh, coming up with some alternatives. So uh, we haven't by any means given up on the parking garage. Um, we will just be pursuing other funding opportunities. And at this time, I really can't go into too much detail about that um, because we are I'm still, you know, exploring various different ideas. They have to go to the, the Board of Port Commissioners for approval. And we are having discussions right now with Rita. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I know you mentioned during your presentation that we're preparing and making sure that we can mit mitigate any potential issues that the current economic downturn has caused. But kind of along those lines, what impacts has the port seen due to, in operations due to COVID-19. Oh gosh, Dookie, do you want to start with yeah. that? <laughs> well, obviously, obviously we've, we've seen a tremendous downturn. Uh, you know, we were down about 30, 30, 30 million dollars in revenue. So obviously COVID has had a tremendous impact. And uh, we, I really want to thank, you know, reach out to all of our poor tenants who are tightening their belt and doing everything they can to uh, get through this uh, tough times. We're in the process of, uh, ne of negotiating with our tenants to potentially redo their leases to try to uh, assist them with uh, because of this downturn. But yeah, it's had a tremendous impact just like it has with any other industry. Uh, but we're, we're confident that we will get through this uh, because we really do have some very strong tenants and the tenants are the, the key to the success of our, of our, of our organization. And so, yeah, it has been, it's been, it has been a tough time, but we feel confident that we'll get through it. Yeah, it has been, it has been very tough and it's been tough on our employees as well. Um, but, you know, we have always been fiscally conservative as a port and we do have uh, reserves and that allows us to be able to still continue um, our operations and to, as, as Dookie, um, discussed uh, to be able to um, work with our tenants. And it was, it, I think it has a lot to do with our fiscal conservativeness in the past, as well as our employees working with us, as well as our tenants. Okay, thank you. And I, I know I wanna be sensitive to time, so this is gonna be a great wrap up question, I think for everybody. Um, we were asked to get a quick rundown of the Port Master Plan's next steps and timing. Um, is there anything you might be able to share on that? Yeah, uh, I, I, I would refer to the chair because this is her pet project. So go for <laughs> it. Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to say it's my pet project, but it, <laughs> it, it did start in 2013 when I was uh, chair for the first time. And uh, for you, uh, those who may not be as familiar with it, it is a, uh, a update on our port master plan that had not been um, amended or updated since like 1981. So it was definitely, um, you know, time, time was coming for it to be updated. Uh, we have gone through, you know, the visionary process. Uh, we released a draft of the port, a second draft actually of the port master plan. The second draft includes all of the comments that we received from the public uh, when we had released the first draft earlier, um, probably about a year ago, actually. And it's, took that long to um, come up with the second draft because we really did uh, listen to uh, everybody who participated in our outreach program. We actually went out to the various different community groups and we talked to them um, about, you know, what their desires were and what they would like to see in the plan. And we thoroughly, you know, went through all of those and incorporated what we could into our port master plan. So that is, um, out for public comment and it's going before the board in December. Um, we're not going to be approving it, but we're going to basically um, hopefully give it a thumbs up for it to begin its environmental review. Uh, the secret process, we anticipate that should take about a year 
And then after that, we will, as a result of CEQA review, probably revise the plan somewhat and then uh, bring that before the, the port board for approval and then to the Coastal Commission for its uh, certification. So we're looking at probably about two more years to get it through. Um, as a side note though, uh, the port master plan update does not affect the National City Balance Plan and it does not affect the Chula Vista Master Bayfront Plan. These two projects have been excluded from the port master plan because they're already going through an extensive planning um, with, in the case of National City, it's already going through an extensive public um, discussion and environmental review. And, and in, in the case of Chula Vista, it had already done that many years ago in 2012. So as a result, it's not part of the port master plan update. So it's not going to be impacted in any way um, with the Port Master Plan updates process. Thank you so much. I wanna thank all of our speakers today. Uh, it was tremendously insightful. I know everybody has appreciated it. And if any other questions come in, we'll be glad to pass those on to you and get those answers back to those folks. Um, I also wanna thank Steve with Sweetwater Authority, both for uh, sponsoring our event and for being our MC of sorts today. So thank you so much for helping us uh, navigate a virtual world, but thank you all. We have, uh, tomorrow we have our uh, second or third part now of our elected official series. So hopefully we can have you join us for that. It's four o'clock on Tuesday. Um, we'll have an email going out shortly, but great speakers. We have our newly, uh, our, uh, sorry, county supervisor elect will be joining us. And we also have our lo local state assembly one. So we hope you'll be able to join us for that. And December 1st, we'll have, um, as of right now, we definitely have our soon to be uh, retiring county supervisor, uh, Mr. Cox. And then on the 8th, we're putting together the final speakers in the series. So we'll get that information out shortly. But thank you all for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow as well. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thanks. All right, have a good one. Thank you, bye.